And that immediately prompted questions because when I teach and Bonnie and I teach in, in uh, Bible institutes and seminaries and classrooms, I always get these two questions. Number one, where is America in prophecy? Number two, why is America not in prophecy? Now look up. What a great question. I'm glad you asked those. So I wrote them over here. We're looking at 2 Peter, but immediately this lesson, this week's lesson, which I envision, uh, I'm sitting on this side of the table and, and all of you are, are joining me. You're either at Panera or Starbucks or Chipotle or, or we're sitting you know, in a small group in someone's living room and we all have our Bibles and notebooks and I'm introducing this week's study to you. Now, remember, that's how this started way back uh, when Bonnie and I were in ministry and local churches around America. That's what we did all the time in our home and, and wherever we could gather people. We taught the Bible. But now the Lord is blessed uh, because of COVID and everyone got used to online meetings. I'm having this Bible study while Bonnie and I travel as missionaries. And so we've just popped into the studio, just got back from 12 weeks on the road. We're here for three weeks and we're leaving again. And I'm sitting across the table talking about Second Peter, and I would look up at you across the table and say, when I talk about the end of everything and Bible prophecy, do you think of these two questions? Because everywhere we travel, this, these two questions are what students come up with. And this is what they say. Where is American biblical prophecy? And if they're not in biblical prophecy, why is America not in biblical prophecy? So I'm going to real quickly... Uh, as a part of this 2 Peter 3 study, but actually I'm going to divide it. It's going to become a question freestanding on YouTube, plus it's a part of our small group study. Because so many people have this question, I want them to, to get this biblical framework to understand. Now there's five sobering possibilities of why America is not in biblical prophecy. Number one, we get aligned in with the Antichrist and, and we are a part of the Western army. That's one possibility. I'll talk about that. Number two, we implode uh, because of everything that's going on with the, the debt in our country, 30 plus trillion that that somehow uh, we default or whatever financially and the whole country just kind of unravels or we explode. Have you been listening to news lately? Every news outlet has carried the fact that Russia has threatened the United Kingdom and the United States. You've caught that, right? I'm gonna show you a clip in just a minute that I pulled off of uh, a Russian news station where they actually in Russian are talking and saying, if you uh, of Britain and you of the United States don't stop helping the Ukraine, we're going to respond and it's sobering. Uh -huh. And what they said is four of their missiles, two on the East Coast, two on the West Coast, would completely wipe out about three quarters of the population of the United States. Okay, that's the explode. Or a blackout, we're gonna talk about that. Did you know that one missile exploded at 300 miles up in the atmosphere would make an electromagnetic pulse that would basically wipe out all of our electric transmission lines, all of our generators, all of our phone systems, uh, all of our uh, cell towers that, that we all heavily depend on, plus all the other infrastructure. Want to know something terrible? If the electricity goes off, how do we stop the chain reaction in all the atomic reactors without electricity? They have backup generators, but they only last so long, okay? And then we could dry out. Remember the mega drought that's going on right now? The largest fire uh, right now in our country is, is a byproduct of this drought that's going on in the whole Western United States. And I'll show you pictures of that. So where's America? Uh, we'll cover that point by point. Why is America not biblical prophecy? So let's go back to the slides and I'm gonna walk you through this and explain it. Uh, first of all, and this is the, the first lesson that underlines and kind of uh, frames everything. God, in his word, in the book of Daniel, sees only four world empires. Now, I know there are many others, but, but now let me explain that. What do I mean by only four world empires? 
God looks at Jerusalem as the center of the world because his throne, he's enthroned over Jerusalem. They are his chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. All of his oracles come through them. The scriptures come through them. The apostles came through them. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, God the Son, came through them. So God has them as the, the focus of world history. So there are four empires that have had an impact on the people of the land of Israel. And those four empires are how God maps out the history of the world to the very end. So let me show you what I mean on the slide. God sees only four world empires. And we're gonna look at this in Daniel chapter two. Now basically this, God said four kingdoms fulfill his plans until the end. Now I'm not, we've already studied the book of Daniel, you can look back at that, but here are the references if you want to uh, look them up right now. So first of all, God says these four kingdoms surround Jerusalem and Christ's uh, death, burial, and resurrection. So everything in God's plan is around Jerusalem and the sacrifice of Christ, which happened at Jerusalem. So look at number two. This is the prophetic parameters. This is all Bible prophecy. You have to understand these parameters. There are four kingdoms, all prophecies weave together to that. Jerusalem is the central focus of all biblical prophecy. But look what Daniel 9.24 adds, and the people of the Roman Empire, because they are the people that destroyed the temple. So they destroy the temple, and they're the ones that crucified Christ, right here. So they destroy the temple and crucify Christ. So they're the people of the Roman Empire. And what it says is the Antichrist, the Antichrist is from the Roman Empire. Now that's going to be very important. I'll show you in a minute. And then here's the last thing. If you read Revelation 16 and 19 with Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the final war, we call it Armageddon, has armies that come from the east. Remember the kings of the east, it says in, in Revelation 16, from the north, the kings of the south, but they join the western ruler who is the Antichrist, who is part of the Roman Empire. Wow. So here's, if, if you wanted to see a picture, so Daniel's vision, if we see Daniel's vision with a picture uh, that we can explain, it would look something like this. Daniel 2 says, Babylon is the head of gold. Silver is the torso is Persia. Brass is uh, down through the thighs is Greece. And then iron, the two legs, and then iron again, but mixed with clay are the feet. So basically Daniel 2 says that there are these four empires with the Roman Empire being the fourth and a revived Roman Empire being the final, but it's still that fourth kingdom. Now in Daniel 7, this is fascinating, when God repeats this vision, Daniel 2 is from mankind's view that, you know, a head of gold and silver, that's all pretty, you know, this statue. But in Daniel 7, they're called these beasts, a winged lion, a bear, a leopard, a terrible beast, a ten-headed beast, which is Rome too. Now let me go a little further. Uh, the gold was the Babylonian Empire. The silver is the Medo-Persian Empire. The bronze of Daniel 2's statue is the Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. The iron, the Roman Empire, the iron and clay, the end times in which we live right now. So the Roman Empire has never ceased. It just morphs. Now let me take you over here to this map, and I want to show you what I mean. Uh, you've seen this map often. This is the Roman Empire, and this is the Mediterranean here. And the Roman Empire is this darkened area all the way around the Mediterranean, plus up here and all the way down. I mean, Rome extended its power as far as it could. So Rome continued to exist right here in the Eastern Empire in Constantinople until 1453. Remember 1492 was Columbus who sailed, uh, you know, outward exploring the world. Well, during Columbus's lifetime, there was still a Roman Empire, the Eastern Empire here. 
was conquered by the Ottomans. They rose up, they kind of came in from uh, uh, outside the Roman Empire as uh, barbarians, and then they overwhelmed the empire and finally knocked it out in 1453. But here's what I'm trying to explain to you. As soon as this Roman Empire ceased to exist, the Ottoman Empire, which is all of this area of ancient Rome, the Ottomans took over all of Turkey, all of the Middle East area, and you know here in Northern Africa. When they got done, Portugal started making a huge empire. I'm going to show you all this. Then Spain made a huge empire. France made a huge empire. And the final empire is right here. The largest empire of all was the United Kingdom or England. Now look back at the slides and I'll show you what I mean. Look at these statistics. You can look all this up on Wikipedia. The Roman Empire was 5 million square miles. So million square miles I abbreviated as MSM. It declined in the east. The Roman Empire started in 746 on the peninsula of, of what we call Italy, and it continued till it was overthrown by the Ottomans in 1453. So there's the Roman Empire, basically, of what Daniel talked about. This massive iron, two-legged, you know, that's both sides of the Mediterranean, north and south, northern Africa and Europe, basically, were the two parts of the Roman Empire. But look, it didn't really cease. It morphs. What happens to the Roman Empire? It becomes the Ottoman Empire. 5.2 million square miles are ruled as, as a part of what used to be the Roman Empire. Then it became the Portuguese Empire. They ruled 5.5 million square miles. Look at that, for 400 years. The Spanish Empire, huge, 5.3. Look at this, for over 300 years, uh, that was one of the great empires of the world. The French Empire, 4.4 million square miles, only about 100 years. Then we know so well the British Empire, which was the biggest empire the world has ever known, reigned for over 200 years. Look at this, 13.7 million square miles. So it just morphs, every piece See, this is the Roman Empire. Every piece of the Roman Empire had its day, we could say, in the sun. But look at number seven here. America was a part of the British Empire. And it's now the current world power. Since uh, right after World War I, when Britain started to decline and the, the uh, colonies started breaking off, America ascended and we're still the, the global superpower. So. Back to this map, all of this is the Roman Empire. This Eastern Empire fell, became the Ottoman Empire, then the, the Portuguese Empire, then the Spanish Empire, then the French Empire, then the United Kingdom. Each piece had its day in the sun, but it never ceased to exist. So now let's look at the possibilities. What happens to the USA? Well, five sobering possibilities. We could align ourselves and become part of the revived Roman Empire of the West. Here's a picture. You can get this. This is this, is this year's NATO. You hear a lot about NATO, right? Uh, you know, this is uh, the Ukraine right there. And of course, this is Russia. All of these bluish, all of these nations are somehow either applying or part of NATO. And look, the only thing that isn't a part of the old Roman Empire is right here, this area. So it could be that America, through NATO, through the revived Roman Empire, aligns itself, see, to become part of the revived. That's Roman Empire II, as you saw. Remember, uh, there's the first kingdom, the second kingdom, the third kingdom of Daniel, the fourth kingdom is Rome, and Rome part two is the revived Roman Empire, which could be we align, and that's why we're not in prophecy, we're part of the Western Confederation, the Antichrist kingdom. Number two, we implode financially. Now, just a second, look up and think about this. Uh, we've gone through supply chain crisis, the cryptocurrency explosion, and, and then, implosion, you know, all the cryptos have dropped, 
the stock market has dropped, the real estate market exploded during COVID, and then now the, the real estate market is starting to decline. Now we're having all kinds of inflation, gasoline heading toward $5 a gallon. Uh, I can't believe I was going through our family pictures, looking at them on the phone, and in the background of one of the pictures, it said $2.50 a gallon. And I thought, where's that? I wanna go get some gas. It's before our eyes, we're seeing this, this incredible global financial distress. Look back at the slides. What could happen to the USA? Well, we owe more money than, than most of the rest of the world combined. Financially, because of our $30 trillion debt bomb, it could cause different parts of the United States to default. Uh, it could cause some kind of a disruption uh, for us to stop being powerful. So an implosion. Uh, I call it the US public debt, $30 trillion uh, debt bomb. It's kind of like waiting to explode and cause uh, severe financial trouble. Here's the third one. We align, we implode. How about America just explodes? Did you know Russia, June 1st, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Russia is threatening the United States. And what if they stop threatening and actually do what they say? They said if they launched two to four of their Sarmat missiles, they would wipe out the United States. This is actually, look, this, this I clipped out of the online news. Update, Russia, this is June 1st, 2022. And, and it wasn't the first time they said it. They've been saying since the Ukraine war started. Russia threatens to wipe out the USA with just four of their Sarmat code in America uh, and Western Europe. They call them Satan nukes. The real name, you can look it up online, is Sarmat. Named after Sarmatia, which is a part of the Ukraine, which is a part of ancient Russia. And so they say... Each of their missiles has 15 uh, separate guidable missiles within the main gigantic missile. It's hypersonic. Each one of those is 100 times powerful, more powerful than Hiroshima. So in other words, the, there would be 15 of these warheads uh, on each missile. If they did two missiles, they would put 30 explosions like this down our eastern seaboard, and they would shoot two more and do 30 explosions uh, you know, across the western seaboard, and they said they can wipe us out. Wow. Now look, look at this next one. Over here on the right, this is what I clipped off of the Russian TV station. Watch this video clip. What he's saying is they could send a nuke to wipe out uh, the UK or they could send one of their underwater drones here to explode underwater and tsunami the United Kingdom. Now, that's unbelievable that they're saying that on television. So it could be, number one, America is aligned with the revived Roman Empire and we're part of the Antichrist plan. We implode financially and kind of just, you know, kind of fade out because we can't afford anything, even food, or, Russia or China or someone else actually launches atomic missiles at us. How about this? This is maybe, this is very possible. Under an EMP strike, China could do that today. North Korea could do that today. Russia threatens it. Iran even could do it. What, what does it look like? Well, if you detonate a thermonuclear explosion in the atmosphere 30 miles up, it would cover this much the United States, a 480 mile blast radius. If you detonate it at 120 miles up, it's a thousand miles that it fries all electronics, transmission lines, cell towers, hospitals, nuclear reactors, even the circuitry in our complicated cars. Look at this, at 300 miles, which is just a, a satellite height, it covers the entire United States. A, a, a EMP pulse would be 1,500 miles wide from 300 miles. That's the coverage of just one strike, one 
little EMP strike. And those, by the way, all those drawings are from the congressional hearings. They've been having hearings on this for 20 years because we've known this could happen. So what could happen? Five sobering possibilities. Here's the last one. We could dry out under the 1200 year mega drought we see unfolding in the West right now. I mean, we don't have to join the Antichrist. We don't have to go broke financially. We don't have to get attacked by atomic weapons or, or face a blackout. We can just dry out. We're facing right now in the Western United States where uh, you know one third of all of our vegetables come from right here. Uh, so much of, of America's population is being totally affected by the Colorado River waterway. It's drying up. Look, look at this. This is a typical example. You can see Lake Powell, Lake Mead, and every other reservoir between the, the headwaters and down here in the Gulf of Mexico are drying up. And this is last year's uh, picture. You ought to see how bad it is this year. So where is American prophecy? Uh, or why is American non-prophecy? Look here on the board. There are five possibilities, and they're, they're very sobering. Uh, we can align with the Antichrist to be totally godless. We could implode financially. We can explode with atomic attack. We can have an EMP or just the drought, just a series of mega climate shifts. Can you imagine if the drought hit the central United States, the Ogala Aquifier, and we couldn't grow corn and wheat? Did you know there, there are three main crops that feed the world, corn, wheat, and rice? And, and if we have any hit on those, we're talking famine, okay? So, so you say, what is this, trying to scare us? No. God explains the end of everything. And God tells us, now, now see, this is the whole reason we're studying Second Peter. God says, what lasts forever and how does that shape your daily life? When I spent my week, and I've, I've already done this class, I'm introducing it to you. But I've already spent all week long reading, reading, reading 2 Peter and putting into my journal everything I found. And basically what I came up with is, if God shows us what lasts forever, it should shape my daily life. I should start living for what's not going to burn up and, and dry out and, and get EMP'd. Are you floating or rowing? We're going to look at godly living is a struggle. But here's the real application. And for those of you that are just tuning in for the Q&A on is American prophecy and if it's not, why? Here's your application, okay? When it feels like the end of the world is near, what are Christians supposed to do? Dig a kind of a, a cavern to hide in and store food? Is that what we're supposed to do? Get as far away from civilization as possible? Is that what we're supposed to do? Live off the grid? That, that, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this, when you feel like the end is coming, live redemptively. We're going to study that in this course in just a couple of minutes. Stay alert so that you see God's word unfolding. Build fireproof. Invest your life in what you can never lose. Your true, true net worth is what can never be taken away from you. And that's what God explains to us. Look up. We should be looking up for our redemption draws near, and we should be the most hope-filled people on earth. We should be the ones that are peaceful, calm, not living in fear, not living in anxiety, not living in constantly, you know, wondering if something's going to happen to us. God said, I'm holding you in my hands. I am holding the future. I hold your life's breath. I know every day of your life. I know what you need, and I will bring you through or take you home. And taking you home is even better than being carried through the, the struggle. And finally, as Second Peter ends with, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Obey Jesus. Experientially know how to obey and follow him. So that is, is the answer to, to these twin questions. Where is American biblical prophecy? And why is America not in Bible prophecy? There's some very sobering possibilities, okay? But rather than focus on fearing those things, live redemptively, stay alert, build fireproof, look up, and obey Jesus. Now let's go back to the slides. So that's the answer to where is American prophecy and why America is not in prophecy. Now let's move on to week 48 
of our 52 greatest chapters, 2 Peter 3.